Joe Alden, MD here, also known as Dr. Bones of the survival medicine website doomandbloom.net and co-author of books like The Survival Medicine Handbook, Alton's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease, and Alton's Pandemic Preparedness Guide. Millions of tons of plastic refuse have entered our oceans annually since about the year 1950, forming what is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, or GPGP. People are often confused, though, about what the garbage patch actually is. The GPGP isn't a landfill-like continent made of plastic that you can walk on, but it's true that due to currents, there is a higher concentration of plastic there than other parts of the ocean. These seem to originate from Asia, North America, and South America. Other collections of debris, by the way, exist in the South Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and the North and South Atlantic. Within the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, several areas contain more visible plastic than others. There's an eastern patch, a western patch, and a convergence zone of plastic waste that perhaps well, maybe hasn't decided yet where it's going to end up. Wherever it goes, there's a negative effect on wildlife from sea turtles to ocean-going birds to whales. You might be shocked to know that despite millions of tons of debris floating in the water, there should be actually much more given the amount that's sent there by the world's nations. Huge amounts of plastic wind up in the ocean every year. Where does it all go? The answer is that the visible trash isn't the only plastic in the ocean. Some may be on the seafloor, perhaps, but it's the tiny bits of plastic smaller than five millimeters, known as microplastics, that are suspended in the water column. These are the most hazardous to your health. Think of it as flecks of pepper that are floating in a bowl of soup. Much of the missing plastic may be such particles. Even smaller ones, microscopic in size, exist that are known as nanoplastics. All of these may have originated from larger floating plastics that have broken up over time. Exposure to UV light for long periods of time, while well, plastic becomes brittle and breaks into fragments. The resulting microplastic particles are dispersed at all depths in the ocean. The concern about these particles is the fact that they tend to end up in our seafood. A new study in collaboration with the UK's University of Exeter and Australia's University of Queensland analyzed seafood for the presence of plastics. They found microplastics in every item of seafood sampled. The five types of plastic most commonly identified were polystyrene, polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, polypropylene, and polymethyl methylacrylate. These plastics are commonly found in packaging and all sorts of manufactured synthetic textiles. The lead researcher of the study that was published in the journal Environmental Science and Technology said that considering an average serving, a seafood eater could be exposed to approximately 0.7 milligrams of plastic when ingesting an average serving of oysters or squid and up to 30 milligrams of plastic when eating sardines. Despite washing each sample to remove any plastic associated with packaging, the study found 0.4 milligrams of plastic per gram of tissue in squid, 0.07 milligrams in shrimp, 0.1 milligram per gram in oysters, 0.3 milligrams in crabs, and 2.9, a whopping 2.9 milligrams per gram in sardines. Every item contained some polyvinyl chloride, and the highest amounts came from polyethylene. Each sample, however, varied in the quantity and type of plastic found. It appears that plastics ingested by seafood progresses to their edible parts. Other ways that microplastics may end up in food could be airborne particles, machinery, and handling during the processing phase. As about 17% of the protein consumed by humans consists of seafood, the findings suggest that those who regularly eat seafood are also eating plastic. It's possible that humans may be consuming 39,000 to 52,000 microplastic particles every year. And it's not only in seafood. Micro and nanoplastics have been found in beer, honey, sea salt, and even bottled water. How bad is this for us? Well, it's uncertain how toxic the ingestion of microplastics is, but it's very likely that there's not much benefit to it. Since we can test for the presence of microplastics in food, we should consider making it part of the labeling so that the public knows just what it's consuming. The answer to the problem, however, is preventing plastics from making it to the open ocean in the first place before they break down into microplastics. How do you think we can best decrease plastic pollution? I'll let you think about that one.
This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. By the way, don't forget that we have an entire line of quality medical kits, some one of a kind, and individual supplies at store.doomandbloom.net. That's store.doomandbloom.net. Check them out. You'll be glad you do.